<laughs> anyway, welcome class. The Classics 160B1. Meet the Ancients. I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen. And today we are going to finish... Well, kind of not. Mm, no. Hmm. Today we're going to talk about the the time of peace, right? We talked. To, we started the Pax Romana last time, and what we're going to do is talk about the kind of height of the Roman Empire. And one of the interesting things is that when you're talking about the height of the Roman Empire, in many ways, there's like not that much interesting stuff to talk about, right? It's not like people are being killed all the time and there's giant bloody civil wars between rival factions and there's like invasions of like far flung areas. We're kind of at this weird moment where for a couple hundred years, Rome just like has their shit together and it just works pretty well. And uh, we are going to kind of see how that occurs today through some of the architectural developments in Rome at that time. And then next week, what we'll do is we'll start to see when it all starts to fall apart, right? Uh, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. So let's go ahead and bring down the projector here. Fire this thing up. Lecture 13.3, Empire Through Architecture. So we are going to start with a few announcements. Um, then we are going to recap the Pax Romana, right? The Roman peace, that period from the start of Augustus until just around 200 CE, right? We're talking about 200 years here. Um, and what we're gonna cover during that time is the development of several monuments in the city of Rome, right? So if you've got it in your future to go over to Italy for a study abroad program, or you just wanna travel there for fun, or whatever it's gonna be, right? Take notes, put all of these things on your list of things to go see, and you can literally trace the history of the city of Rome, right? And of Roman civilization within the city of Rome itself through this architecture. Then what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll have kind of a Q&A on project formats. So if anybody's got questions, uh, concerns, jokes, right? That is gonna be the time for that. And then we're gonna finish the last 20 minutes or so um, on the, uh, the honors project. So everybody else, if you're not working on that, you can go take your early lunch and we will finish by talking a little bit about Delphi. So what do we have for announcements today? You guys know the basic ones. Put this thing in speaker view. You can see me. You can see the slides. Uh, please try to funnel questions to your TAs um, because otherwise I just get like, I don't know, my brain gets overwhelmed. <laughs> You'd think with a big old head like I've got, it would be able to handle multiple things at once, but <laughs> it's just not very good at that. Um, okay, and then down below here, uh, start working on your final project. There is one final opportunity for extra credit in this class on our last Friday, which is actually the day the project is due, right? What we're going to do is we're going to have a little showcase and anybody who would like to, up to about 10 people, uh, can present part of their project if they would like, right? And if you do that, you'll get a little half grade bump on your final project, right? So five points on the final project itself. So nobody has to, if you're like, my project is terrible and I do not want people seeing this. That's fine. Don't do it, right? If you're like, my project is awesome and the rest of the class does not deserve to see this. I, I mean, I guess that's okay. <laughs> but if you're like, I worked super hard on this, everybody must see the glory that I have developed, then uh, absolutely sign up for this thing. The way it's gonna work is I'll have a uh, Google Doc for you guys on Monday and just put your name in there. Here's what you're not allowed to do that happens all the time, all right? You can't put your name on there to present your project and then like the morning of the, the presentation day be like, oh, no, nah, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> the first time I did this, that happened to me with like a third of the people. <laughs> and so the presentations were cut a little short. But um, anyway, I will have that ready to go on Monday. Think about whether you would like to present a little bit of your project. The way those presentations will go, you'll be like, hi, my name's Billy and uh, I am working uh, you know, I'm a freshman here in the uh, architecture program, and I wanted to do something on the kind of differences between Greek and Roman architecture when it comes to like housing, because we haven't talked a lot about housing. So I wanted to see what was going on with that. And so in order to do that, what I've done is I've done like a cool 3D model of a house, or I've made a 
you know, documentary about housing, something along those lines, and then show a little bar part of what you've done. Okay, um, yeah, no problem. Always happy to, to give you guys opportunities to present. And also it's a good opportunity um, if you just want the opportunity to present in front of like 100 plus other people, ideal, ideally it would be like 200 plus, but you know, you can't make them show up. <laughs> um, it's a good skill to learn to be able to do that, that kind of speaking. Dr. Rob, just a logistical question. Is there like a time limit for each student to present in case so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to limit the number of presentations to like 10. And so students are going to have about five minutes to present. And what that's going to mean is that like if you've made like a 10 minute long documentary, you're not going to have time to like show the whole thing. So what I'd like you to do is like introduce yourself, talk a little bit about the topic of your project, like why you were interested in whatever you're doing. You're like, I love pizza. And I wanted to figure out if the ancient Romans had pizza and they didn't. So I did something else about food. Um, so a little introduction on why you're interested and then show like, like present like a snippet of what you've got. Right. Um, I think that'll be a useful way forward. And each person will have about five minutes. So, yeah, James, that's that's exactly. Uh, yeah. For that, you know, pull a little bit here, a little bit there. You can start at the beginning, maybe fast forward a little bit. That'll work. All right, so recapping the Pax Romana, remember that this time of the Roman peace comes after a century of civil war. You've seen this a bunch of times, like after Rome expands and starts taking over the Mediterranean, right? We get Roman generals like Marius on the left and Sulla on the right, uh, taking Roman armies and starting to fight each other with them. And if that didn't fix things, then we've got Julius Caesar on the left and Pompey on the right, and they take their armies and start fighting each other with them. And then Caesar's assassinated, but that doesn't end the civil wars. And we've got Octavian and we've got Mark Antony who originally team up, right? They originally team up to kill the, uh, the senatorial assassins. But then they take their armies and start fighting each other with them. So for a century, the most powerful men in Rome end up taking their Roman armies. And instead of going to conquer new areas, they start fighting each other with them. And it's an incredibly bloody and chaotic time in the city of Rome. And that's why with Augustus, we end up calling this the kind of start of the Pax Romana or the Roman peace, right? Because it's in contrast to this long time of civil war. And this period, right, the Pax Romana is going to last from about, we'll say, 31 or 27, right? You can kind of choose there based on whether you want to do it. The Battle of Actium, that's sometimes the date. Other times people will pick 27 BC because that's the date when he gets the title of Augustus. But somewhere around then to, you know, the end of the second century CE, things in Rome are going pretty well, right? There's no civil war. Like Rome continues to expand to some extent, right? They're going to get a little, a little more area up here and a little more area out here. Um, but, you know, they're fighting small battles against small foreign foes not large battles against each other. And we talked last time, and we've been talking all week, right, about Augustus and just how lucky Rome is to have had somebody who's like mildly competent as the kind of winner of that last set of civil wars. And the, you know, one of the things that I do want you to kind of remember here, right, one of the things to definitely write down is the basic kind of arrangement that Augustus works out with the Senate in order to stop civil war and kind of usher in this new area or new era um, in this period that we call the Roman Empire, right? And the general agreement there is that Augustus stands up and he says, I'm restoring the Republic, right? Senate, you are wonderful. Like lead on behalf of the people. And rhetorically, he's like giving power back to the Senate. In reality, the Senate is giving all the real power to Augustus. Right. So it like kind of reestablishes the traditional form, but substantively everything kind of changes. And now all the power resides in one person. And we talked last time, right, about some of the different strategies that Augustus used in order to consolidate power and kind of make it OK 
that there was a single person ruling in Rome, right? So part of it is this rhetoric that he's using with the Senate, symbolically restoring the Republic. Part of it is sending out kind of propagandistic messages, right? The altar of peace that we're looking at here, the mausoleum of Augustus, the temple of Mars Ultur, right? Mars the Avenger. Um, all these sorts of kind of architectural and artistic messages that peace is now here and that um, it has been restored to the Roman world. And then there's also a number of practical things, right? So we saw that he increased the grain dole, right? So people are now getting grain for free. Um, he's ended up standardizing currency across the Mediterranean, which facilitates trade. And so it really is, it is a multi-prong approach that this guy takes to kind of establishing, consolidating um, power in this single person, right? So it's re rhetoric where he's restoring the Republic, but really he's getting all the power. It's kind of propagandistic art and architecture, right? Things like the Arapacus or the Altar of Peace, the Temple of Mars Ultor. We saw the statue, right, last time, Prima Porta with the, uh, with the little like baby Cupid on his leg and, and Augustus um, receiving the standards from the Parthians on it. And then it's like practical things that actually impact people's lives, right? Things like the grain dole and trade and stuff like that. And then finally, one of the reasons it works is because he lives super long, right? He rules for like 40 years before he dies. And what we saw last time is that his successors are all bonkers, right? We've got Tiberius, super paranoid, right? Uh, and just for the second half of his reign, retires to the island of Capri, builds himself a villa, and uh, just acts real, real weird. And then we've got, oh yeah, but we have, it, over the course of the empire, it doesn't really affect anything at all. We've got Caligula, right? He's cutting off the heads of gods and putting his own head on them. He's uh, making out with his own family and then killing them. He's just declaring to everybody who will listen that he is indeed a living god. So he gets killed by the Praetorian Guard. He's tried to make his horse consul. Um, we, you know, the consulship has really gone downhill, to be honest. I mean, this thing was super prestigious at the beginning of the Republic. And now we've got Incatatus, the horse of uh, Caligula as consul. We've got poor Claudius. This is, man, this is like out of all the emperors, this guy just can't catch a break, right? He wants to be a, a historian. Um, he doesn't want to be emperor. He's forced to be emperor. He stutters. People make fun of him. His wife's cheating on him. Other wife is abusing him. Third wife poisons him to death. And overall, things work pretty well. It's actually under Claudius that like Rome is able to incorporate the island of Britain into the Roman Empire. And then the guy who killed, or the, the woman who killed Claudius, right, the, the third wife, is the mother of Nero, who clearly has quite a bit of issues, and he ends up killing his mom. Um, he ends up singing while Rome burns to the ground. Uh, and then we saw that what he does with that giant area that has been burned to the ground, he builds himself an enormous palace, right? So this is known as the Domus Aria, or the Golden House of Nero. And one aspect of this is this giant statue um, of, of uh, Nero that, that stands in the Golden House. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is kind of take you through the rest of the Pax Romana, the kind of high point of the Roman Empire, through architecture in the city of Rome. Right. So you can still go see if you would like. You can go see the uh, the ruins of the Domus Aria um, right in the central part of Rome. But not a lot of it uh, is still around. Right. And I'll, I'll show you why that's the case in a second. So let's kind of establish where we are time wise. Right. At the death of Augustus, the Roman Empire is pretty large here. Right. We've got all of Gaul, Spain, North Africa, Italy, um, Macedon and Greece, you know, Western Asia Minor, the Levant, Egypt. Um, it's pretty large. You can see the kind of other little tan areas. That's where Rome gets to at its max. So we can kind of go back and forth here, right? Oh, oh, there we go. Not that much changes, right? This is like Rome at its like greatest extent. It's not that different than the very start of the Roman Empire under Augustus, right? 
So again, what you want to picture as happening during this time is Rome's poking around. They're poking around up in Germany here, right? They're poking around over here and over here. And they win some battles and they gain the area and then they'll lose some battles and lose it and win some battles and gain some and lose some battles and lose some. But for the most part, right, under Augustus, under the very first emperor, Rome is also already like at a very, very large geographical kind of extent. And it doesn't get that much bigger. Again, this is kind of the, the largest we get um, about 100 years later. Okay, so Nero ends up getting killed, right? We have something called the Year of the Four Emperors, right? So Nero is killed in 68, the Year of the Four Emperors. Uh, these guys rule really, really shortly. Um, and then eventually we get the last of these guys, Vespasian, come in. Um, and he ends up kind of calming things down and starting a new dynasty known as the, uh, the Flavians, right? The Flavians are the new dynasty. But also with the death of Nero, like people were super pissed off that in the aftermath of a fire that burned a huge portion of the city of Rome, that like the best real estate that got burned got taken by the emperor and used for his own personal like palace. And so one of the things uh, that Vespasian does is he starts a new building program using some of that area. Where's, why don't I have a, why don't I have a slide of the Colosseum? Who's putting these things together? This is ridiculous. We need to bring up a picture of the Colosseum here. Let's see what we got. All right, cl close enough, all right? So what ends up happening, right, um, is that uh, in the aftermath of Nero, they tear down some of that house and the succeeding emperors end up building the kind of first stone amphitheater in Rome on the grounds of that house, right? This is a way to give back to the people in the aftermath of somebody who was really kind of not treating the people very well, right? Um, and so when we look at the Colosseum, the official name for this at the time is the Flavian Amphitheater, right? So Flavian, because that's the dynasty that built it, and then Amphitheater, because that's the architectural form, right? So Ampa, like kind of both, and then theater, meaning theater, right? So it's like two theaters jammed together, right? The theaters are the ones that are semicircles. You put two of those together, you got an amphitheater, and that is where the gladiatorial games end up taking place, right? So plays take place in a theater, chariot racing takes place in a circus, gladiatorial games take place in an amphitheater, and there is no better amphitheater than the Colosseum itself. Now, the reason it gets its name, the Colosseum, is because they left that giant statue up in, in like place there, right? They kind of changed it a little bit so that it would resemble like, uh, like a god rather than Nero. Um, but that huge statue that we saw a little bit earlier, yep, this guy over here, right? That's the Colossus. So that's where we get the word Colosseum. That's why we call it the Colosseum today because there was this giant statue out in front. Okay, now, uh, the successor to Vespasian is this guy Titus, right? And what we're looking at here is known as the Arch of Titus. And this is what's known as a triumphal arch in Rome, right? And these are things that when a emperor general would win a battle against a foreign foe, there were actually very specific rules. If you killed so many people against foreigners, took prisoners, got so much money, you would get thrown a triumph. And part of that involves a procession through the city. And very frequently, emperors would build these kind of triumphal arches to dedicate kind of, um, dedicated to their, their victory over a certain group of people. And then they might process through it during the triumphal procession. Now, Titus, the victory he is claiming, claiming is over the Jewish people. And one of the very interesting kind of icon iconographic things from this triumphal arch is what's depicted on the inside. So what we're doing is we're looking right in here, right, right against the wall, about eye level inside the arch. And we're, what we're looking at are Roman soldiers 
carrying out the kind of treasures from the second temple of Jerusalem, right? And so kind of what comes across most clearly, right? We've got some stuff over here, but what comes across most clearly is the, uh, the kind of giant menorah that Roman soldiers are carrying out. Um, so kind of, again, an interesting look at the relationship between religions, which play a huge role, like, role in the world today, right? Uh, also being negotiated within the, uh, the ancient Roman world. Okay, so all that stuff is taking place in this part of the city, right? We've got our hills over here. This area, the area in the bend of the river, this is the Campus Martius. This is the Palatine Hill, where the palaces are. Here's the Roman Forum. Here's the Colosseum. Archetitus is right in there. Now we're jumping over into the, the Campus Martius, right? And what we're looking at here is one of the first stadia in Rome. Right. So what are we talking? We said an amphitheater is for gladiatorial games. A circus is for chariot racing. A theater is for plays and drama. And a stadium is for kind of traditional Greek style uh, athletic events. Things like running and the pentathlon and the discus throw and the javelin throw. Um, that sort of thing would take place in a stadium. And a stadium has always got this look where it's flat on one end and then it's curved on the other end. And when you'd have the races, you'd start down at the flat end. There would be a turning post somewhere down on this far end. You'd have to run around the post and then back to where you started. Now, the stadium of Domitian, it doesn't really exist, right? You can't really go see the stands or anything like that. But one of the cool things, one of the things that happens very frequently in Rome is that the object itself kind of disappears, but the imprint of that becomes like Im embedded into the urban fabric of Rome. And so when we look at Rome today, we can still see exactly where the Stadium of Domitian was because now it's this giant piazza called Piazza Navona. And so if you've been to Rome, you almost certainly have spent time here, right? There's all sorts of people painting pictures in there and um, selling stuff and cafes and restaurants that, that surround it. A very famous fountain, the uh, Fontana di Quattro Fiumi over here, the Fountain of the Four Rivers by Bernini with this Egyptian obelisk here. Um, one of the most famous piazzas in all of the city of Rome. It is built exactly on, um, yeah, it's built exactly on the, uh, the floor plan of the Stadium of Domitian. Let's see if we can do Piazza Navona. We can see it a little bit better maybe if we take an aerial view here. I'm gonna get, get myself out of the way here. Yeah, and so you can see, right? You can see flat on one end, the exact shape of the circus, and chair out of the way. There we go. Yeah, you can see it's curved on this other end down here, right? Uh, here's the Fontana di Quattro Fiumi. So again, what we're seeing is even though the remains of the Roman structure don't exist anymore, this is it, like it's built exactly into the uh, the modern city of Rome. Okay, so if we wander eastward a little bit from Piazza Navona or the Stadium of Domitian. Um, we get to what I consider, oh no, we don't get to that yet. First, we get to Trajan's column, right? So Trajan is the guy who kind of expands the Roman Empire to its greatest extent. He's known as the greatest and best of all the emperors. Um, you don't have to really remember a lot of what he does. He, he wins victory over the Dacians. So you got that going for you. Uh, but what he does to commemorate that is he builds this cool column, right? And the entire column itself, right, records the story of his victories. Um, and then you put a statue of himself at the top. And now the statue of Trajan isn't up there anymore, right? But you put a, I can't even tell who that is. Is that St. Peter? Is he carrying keys? You put a saint up there in, instead in the modern world. But on Trajan's column, one of the cool kind of things is that they've done casts of these. And this is, again, that Museum of Roman Civilization where you, um, you can, everything is kind of a replica, right? 
And you can go through here and see the entire sculptural program of the, uh, the victory over the Dacians. Some of the cool pictures, right? Like the Roman Testudo fighting formation here, right? So that's the one where they call it like the turtle. And you get half the people with their, uh, their shield above them and the other people out in front with the shields in front. And it's like impenetrable um, to, uh, to any sort of attack. Okay, so we've got the, uh, yeah, we got Trajan's Column. And now we get to my favorite of the, uh, the Roman um, archaeological uh, monuments, right? Uh, for my money, it does not get better than the Pantheon. This is like the coolest building. Uh, in antiquity, right, what this was um, is something that was dedicated to multiple gods uh, in the city of Rome. That's why they call it Pantheon, all the gods. And its structure, this is built during the reign of Hadrian, um, its structure is very, very unique, right? So we've got this traditional Roman looking temple on front. But when we look at the back, it's like a giant cylindrical drum, right? And the reason it's like a cylindrical drum on the back of the temple here is because it's holding up this dome, right? So for 1500 years, the dome on top of the Pantheon was the largest in the world, right? And what you're looking at, to give you a sense of scale, the oculus, the thing that's um, the, the open area here that both kind of lets in light as well as uh, um, lightens the, the weight of the roof, uh, this thing is 30 feet wide, just to give you a sense for the, the scale of this. Uh, and the walls themselves were also something like 30 feet wide, and they needed to be that big to hold up the weight of the, uh, the roof. Um, so this thing is, is super, super cool. It's a very unusual style uh, of temple. And whenever you're in Rome or, or really anywhere and you see something that's this well preserved and you're like, how the crap is there a Roman temple that is nearly perfectly preserved? The answer is almost always that it got turned into like a subsequent religious structure, right? So in this case, it's somewhere in the 500s AD, right? 500 CE that this gets turned into a Christian church, and that's why it's so well-preserved, right? Um, and you see the same thing later on, like uh, in modern-day Turkey, if you look at early Christian churches there, if they're really well-preserved, like the Hagia Sophia, the reason it's well-preserved is because it got turned into a mosque, right? So when it's subsequently adopted by another religious group, that's what um, keeps it so well-preserved. All right, then we can go up here, we can cross the Tiber River, uh, and we can look at the tomb of Hadrian, Hadrian's mausoleum. Um, it looks very, very similar. This was modeled on Augustus's mausoleum. And if it looks kind of defensive right now, that's because in the modern world, this serves as uh, the kind of fortress for the Pope. So this is over on the Vatican City side of things. Um, and uh, the, the uh, Pope itself or himself would, would use this as kind of a place to hide in times of, of conflict. Uh, so today it's called Castle St. Angelo, or the Castle of the Angels. And you can see all the different kind of archangels here along the, uh, the bridge leading up to it. And as we get to the end of the Pax Romana, uh, the last like really good Roman emperor uh, during this period was Marcus Aurelius. And he's known as the philosopher emperor uh, because he wrote these kind of books on philosophy as well. Um, and one of the cool kind of... Uh, um, yeah, one of the cool remains of Marcus Aurelius is this bronze statue. And so what we're looking at here is a bronze statue of Aurelius. Uh, and the reason it got preserved was because many people thought it was Constantine, the first Christian emperor, so they didn't want to desecrate that. Archaeologists have subsequently argued, no, it is Marcus Aurelius. Now, if the name sounds familiar, Marcus Aurelius was the emperor and gladiator, and he actually did go to battle against the Germanic tribes. That's actually where the, the movie starts, where they're out fighting the Germanic tribes. And he also pens the meditations, right? His kind of philosophy um, on life. And to kind of finish our, our story of the, the Pax Romana and the emperors in Rome, uh, I like this quote, right, um, about... Marcus Aurelius's perspective on the gods. So he says, live a good life, right? If there are gods and they are just, then they will not care how devout you've been. But you will, uh, I, but they will welcome you based on your virtues that you have lived by. If there are gods and they are unjust, then you shouldn't want to worship them anyway. And if there are no gods, then you'll be gone. 
but you have lived a noble life uh, and that will live on in the memories of your loved ones. So I just kind of liked that as like a, a nice philosophy uh, to, to leave you with today. So well, let's go ahead and do uh, attendance. So today's color is yellow. Go ahead and put in yellow and then you're welcome to stick around for a few minutes if you'd like. And uh, we are going to do a little Q&A thing on um, final projects. But go ahead, take a minute, put in yellow. Uh, if you feel good about your final project, feel free to, um, you know, take an early lunch. All right, so once you've got yellow in there, let's go ahead and think about final project here. All right, so this thing is due two weeks from today, right? Uh, on that day, we are also gonna have a kind of student project showcase, which is totally voluntary. Um, and what I would like you to do, right, the kind of main idea of this project is to translate all the hard work you've been doing on your research project into something that people actually want to engage with, right? I mean, you know, to be very honest, if you take home your, your research paper to your, your poor mother, she's probably going to be like, I don't want to read this. This looks really boring. <laughs> so you've got to come up with some sort of way to take what you're doing and make it interesting, right? And what I would suggest is go in one of two directions. One, either pick something that you've got like kind of some skill in, right? Like if, um, you know, if you're an art major and you want to do something cool with drawing or sculpture or something like that, find a cool way to do it. Um, you know, if you're in uh, computer science, <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see, Harry. Maybe you should write a an actual research paper for yours and then we will see whether she actually wants to read it or not. Um, you know, if, if you're in computer science, think of some way to leverage those skills to, uh, to build something cool related to uh, the, the ancient world. Um, the other direction to go is pick something you have no experience doing, but you think would be a good skill to have, right? Um, if you wanna learn video production, do something video oriented and use this as the opportunity to build that skill, right? If you're like, I've always wanted to make a website, I've, but I've never really done it. Use this as the opportunity to build a cool website. Um, whatever it is, right? Uh, the kind of idea is that either you improve at something you've already been working on a little bit skill-wise, or you develop a new skill, and hopefully those skills are gonna be useful in the long run. Now, along with that, one of the things I, I still uh, want you guys to do is make sure that the research still does come across, right? So that could be a narration of something where you're talking about the sources we have, um, it could be a lot of different ways, but just make sure that the research you've done is still evident in whatever the final project is. Um, and other than that, you know, have some fun with this, be creative, um, work hard to do a nice, like polished job on it. Like, like production value matters. Uh, you know, I think you guys have all taken like enough online classes now that like, I'm sure there are some that like look good and polished. And I'm sure there are others that look like not so much. Um, so production value matters, right? So, so do a good job on this. So I wanted to open it up to the floor. Uh, are there any kind of questions or concerns that you guys have about the project? Um, kind of questions about like, oh, can I do this? Does this sound like a good idea? That sort of thing. Go ahead. So for my project, I had assumed that quality was actually second to just having a lot of heart for the project. <laughs> okay. I tried to throw myself into a interview and video editing, 
and I am garbage at video editing because I've never done anything like that. So would it be better in your eyes to just turn in my uncut footage since it's it's like 20 minutes of just interviewing people? But would that be better or should I try my hand at editing to try and cut it down? I Okay, I would say try your hand at editing, right? Um, going into the, like, as we assess these, right? Um, one of the things that's going to happen and one of the things that's difficult when we do that is everybody's got a different starting point, right? Like, obviously, like somebody who's like a pro at video editing would like be able to jump in and like in a third of the time be able to produce something more polished. But that's okay, right? Like, I want you to throw yourself into the video editing. And even if what comes out isn't like, like the most brilliant documentary since planet Earth or something, um, that's totally fine. We will recognize the efforts that you put into that. Okay, so I, I'd prefer that you you continue to push yourself on that front, try something new, um, and it's it's completely fine if you know it doesn't get to uh, you know National Geographic levels. Okay, and is there a time limit that you were looking at for videos? So what I would say is um, there's no there's no time limit, right? It you can make it kind of as long as it it needs to be. Um, I would say that if you're if you're working alone on something, that something along like about five minutes or so would be a reasonable sort of um, duration for something like this. And if you're beyond that, that's fine. If you're at like one minute or something, you probably want to do a little bit more. Um, but you know, it's it's tough to really tell because everybody's project's going to be so different that like. Maybe it is a little bit shorter, but it's like super highly polished. That's fine. Um, but, you know, five minutes is kind of a nice rough estimate there. Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you. Juliana? Um, so I have a, a couple of questions. Sure. Um, so first, so if my partner and I want to do a video, um, you said for like one person, you said five minutes is good. We're for like a group of two people, would five minutes also be kind of good or should we extend it more time? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would I would ex uh, expand it a little bit and kind of like, the uh, there's no like hard cut rule there where like, um, you know, it has to be two and a half minutes extra, but think of it something like the the most recent revised draft of the, the paper where like for each additional person, you know, you should be adding on more than the kind of baseline at five minutes but it doesn't need to be done totally linearly, right? So you don't need to go to 10 minutes if you have two people and 15 minutes if you have three, um, but do expand it beyond uh, the, the five minute mark. So, you know, maybe something around seven or eight minutes would work well. Okay, um, also another question would be, was that if we want to cite the sources, could we do a, like a credits page at the end? I think a credits page would work really, really well, right? Depending on what you're doing, if you're doing like a movie or something, you may want to like include in the text of it or in the narration itself, like according to Homer, blah, 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 blah. Right. Or like uh, Augustus in his divine deeds, like says something. Right. So you can kind of narrate it like that a little bit. But I think a credits page would work really, really well um, to demonstrate where you're getting your information from. OK, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Harry. Um, so for my final project, I wanted to use the form of TikTok, which is uh, like series of like one minute videos you know yep um how would i go about turning that in would i just like put all five links in if i, were to I do that? yeah i think that would work just fine and, and then so the turning it in thing is great remind me to touch on this next week as well if you're doing anything video based there's um it can be a real pain in the butt to get it uploaded to d2l and yeah, so, I think it should be less than one gigabyte of size, if I remember correctly, or less than 900 megabytes. So yeah, it, and that, that gets filled up really quickly, like more quickly than you would imagine. Um, and so what I would say is links are your friend. Like if you can get it uploaded to TikTok or to YouTube or to Google Drive or something like that, and then just post a Word document or a PDF with the link in it, that works really well from our end. The only thing you have to make sure of is that you set, you know, if it's in something like Google Drive or Box, that you set the um, restrictions, right? So that we're able to view it. But yeah, just putting the five links in there, Harry, would be great. All right, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Emma? 
Um, so if I was interested in doing like a website format for my project around how like detailed do you think it should be? I mean, that, that's something that you, you might want to work out with your, your TA and it's going to differ based on like, you know, what kind of experience you've had doing this. I mean, if you really have done nothing on the website front before it, you know, it may look like it may take you more time to just kind of figure out how that sort of thing works. If you've got some experience, you might be able to put together something that really ends up looking cool. I think what I would expect is, you know, some sort of kind of homepage that uh, introduces the topic and, and kind of lays out what some of the different issues are. And then at least a few kind of um, sub pages that uh, you're able to link to to go to different kind of subtopics of your, your um, research project. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Dylan. Um, I was just wondering, for the uh, website, would it be okay if we use something like Squarespace, like an online, like, do-it-yourself website, or do you want it to, like, be hand-coded? Oh, no, no, you're more than welcome to use, like, um, like a, you know, one of the kind of drag and drop website creators. Um, if, if you can hand code it, I mean, I guess that's, that's awesome, but that, that sounds like a ton of work. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're more than welcome to use Squarespace or, or what are the other ones people have used? Weebly, is that one? Something like that, yeah. All right, okay, so uh, if, yeah, Wix, um, that works well too. Um, okay, if there are no more questions for right now, right, we can take questions next week as well. Guys, feel free to get out of there. If you're uh, in honors and you're working on that, let's go ahead and pop over to engage um, and see if we can meet there and just see to what extent uh, we can get everybody in the same room over there, all right? And um, for everybody else, have a great weekend, right? Relax a little bit, get excited that this course well, not that this course, but get excited that the semester is all almost over. And I very much look forward to seeing you all on Monday. All right, so I will remove the spotlight here. Put in gallery view, there we go. Try to fire this thing up. Uh, TAs, were you guys able to get on here at all? Were you able to set up uh, accounts? I didn't receive any emails on my end, and I actually checked the spam, you know, the spam inbox, just in case. But. Huh. All right. Well, if, if you guys aren't able to get on there, I mean, feel free to, you know, I think we'll, we can take it from here. You guys can go ahead and get out of here a couple minutes early and, and start enjoying your weekend.